Now, I have always adored John Meacham. He was, is, one of the world's greatest luncheon companions from the time he edited Newsweek. And he now contributes to Time Magazine and everything else, including all of that celebrity making television. Get this, this nice guy won the Pulitzer Prize for American Lion, his best-selling biography on Andrew Jackson. And this was a much needed book because I don't think the average person knows a thing about Andrew Jackson. But that is a wonderful book. And he also scored with Franklin and Winston, two of my favorite historical figures, and American Gospel, and more recently with the now controversial Thomas Jefferson in the book, The Art of Power. John Meacham serves on so many boards that he has splinters. And for some reason, he now lives in Nashville. But I think he really lives at Michael's restaurant. I always see him there. He is the greatest. And I have always thought he himself would make a great and good US president. Mr. John Mitchell, my candidate. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I must say, being a great and good U.S. president is a little like being saying you're the best restaurant in a hospital. You know, it's kind of a low bar <laughs> to get over. So thank you, uh, Liz, and for that wonderful introduction. Um, I, I'm very wary of introductions since about three years ago at a book event on the Washington Mall when there was a huge tented event, lots of authors, uh, several thousand readers, a wonderful, wonderful occasion. A woman came running up to me and said, oh my God, it's you. I said, well, yes, you know, existentially speaking, that's hard to argue with. And she said, will you wait right here? I wanna get your new book. I said, yes, ma'am, I'll be right here. And hand to God, she came back with John Grisham's latest book. So. There is a woman somewhere in America with a forged John Grisham book. Um, I didn't have the heart to tell her I was shorter, less attractive, and much less rich. Uh, but she was, she was lovely. So whenever I hear wonderful words like Liz's, I remember there's a woman there who I hope never puts that on eBay. Uh, I do want to talk about Thomas Jefferson. Uh, Bill was right. I will try to talk you into his including him uh, in the Pantheon. Uh, I just submit, as you think about uh, Jefferson, as I'm sure you do a uh, good bit of the time, tall, cool, cerebral, highly intellectual president, more comfortable writing, and yet awfully, awfully good at politics, even though he feels ambivalent about the process. As Mark Twain said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. So uh, just keep <laughs> that in mind. Uh, this is a, a brief scene from the winter of 1801 in Washington. He woke at first light. Lean and loose-limbed, Thomas Jefferson tossed back the sheets in his rooms at Conrad and McMunn's boarding house on Capitol Hill, swung his long legs out of bed, and plunged his feet into a basin of cold water, a lifelong habit he believed good for his health. At Monticello, his plantation in the Southwest Mountains near the Blue Ridge of Virginia, the metal bucket brought to Jefferson every morning wore a groove on the floor next to the alcove where he slept. Six foot two and a half, Jefferson was nearly 58 years old in the Washington winter of 1800-1801. His sandy hair, reddish in his youth, was graying. His freckled skin, always susceptible to the sun, was wrinkling a bit. His eyes were penetrating but elusive, alternately described as blue, hazel, or brown. He had great teeth. It was early February 1801. The Capitol, with its muddy avenues amid scattered buildings, was in chaos and had been for weeks. The future of the presidency was uncertain, the stability of the Constitution in question, and secluded inside Conrad and McMunn's on New Jersey Avenue, a new establishment with stables for 60 horses, 
just 200 paces away from the unfinished Capitol building, Thomas Jefferson was in a quiet agony. He soaked his feet and gathered his thoughts. After a vicious election in which he had challenged the incumbent president, John Adams, it turned out that while Jefferson had defeated Adams in the popular vote, the tall Virginian had received the same number of electoral votes for president as the dashing, charismatic, and unpredictable Aaron Burr of New York, who had been running as Jefferson's vice president. Under the rules in effect in 1800, there was no way to distinguish between a vote for president and one for vice president. What was supposed to have been a peaceful transfer of power from one rival to another, from Adams to Jefferson, had instead produced a constitutional crisis. Anxious and unhappy, Jefferson was, he wrote to his eldest daughter, worn down here with pursuits in which I take no delight, surrounded by enemies and spies, catching and perverting every word which falls from my lips or flows from my pen, and inventing where facts fail them. His fate was in the hands of other men, the last place he wanted it to be. He hated the waiting, the whispers, the not knowing. But there was nothing he could do, and so Thomas Jefferson waited. In the end, after a snowstruck, snowstorm struck Washington, Jefferson narrowly prevailed on the 36th ballot in the House to become the third president of the United States. So began the age of Jefferson, a political achievement without parallel in American life. Judged by the raw standard of the winning and the keeping of power, he was the most successful political figure of the first half of the, American, of the life of the American Republic. For 36 of the 40 years between 1800 and 1840, either Thomas Jefferson himself or a self-described adherent of his served as President of the United States. This unofficial and little noted Jeffersonian dynasty is unmatched in American history. He had a defining vision, a compelling goal, the survival and success of popular government in America. He believed the will of an educated, enlightened majority should prevail. His opponents had less faith in the people, worrying that the broad American public might be unequal to self-government. Jefferson thought that same public was the salvation of liberty, the soul of the nation, and the hope of the republic. He loved his wife, his books, his farms, good wine, architecture, Homer, horseback riding, history, France, the Commonwealth of Virginia, spending money, lots of it, and the very latest in ideas and insights. He believed in America and in Americans. The nation, he said in his first inaugural address in 1801, was the world's best hope. He thought Americans themselves capable of virtually anything they put their minds to. Whatever they can, they will, he said of his countrymen in 1814. More than any of the other early presidents, more than Washington, more than Adams, Jefferson believed in the possibilities of humanity. He dreamed big, but understood that dreams only become reality when their champions are strong enough and wily enough to bend history to their purposes. Broadly put, philosophers think and politicians maneuver. Jefferson's genius was that he was both and could do both, often simultaneously. Such is the art of power. Thank you. Great. Great.